Okay, in this lecture we will go over all of the important features that designate and differentiate phylum chordata from other animal phyla. Chordates share the following features. They have a notochord which provides support for the nerve cord. It has a dorsal nerve cord that uh, traverses to or down the back. Farnagal gill pouches which in us become our astesian tube and tonsils but in fish become their gills and a post anal tail. If you recall when we did the comparative anatomy to prove evolution's existence, we saw that all embryos share similar features, and one of those similar features was the post anal tail. Okay. All right, we mentioned before that um, there are a couple of chordates that are not vertebrates, and these are the two examples. That was yesterday when we did our lesson grabber, and the lesson grabber that mentioned that there are some that are not vertebrates. Uh, or non vertebrate chordates. Examples are tunicates and lancelet. Now, the tunicates, interestingly, as babies, they are very motile, they can move around, but when they become adults, uh, they become sessile, and that word means stationary basically. The sessile and bag like. The lancelots is kind of the reverse, okay? So they have chordate features as adults, so their features are more like chordates as adults as opposed to the tunicates. Okay, so this information would go in the section where it's talking about the subphylum. Now, again, we are vertebrates. We fall into this category when we're looking at our cladogram. Now remember, when you're looking at a cladogram, you're looking at evolutionary uh, lineages and connections. So all of the organisms that are further to the left here are closely related to the invertebrate organisms there, okay? And so those that are further away have less of a evolutionary connection. And when they branch off, okay, when the nodes branch off, that just shows us the different characteristics that they share in common with the common ancestor. All right, so listed here is the classification that we have for our fish. We have jawless fish, cartilage fish and we have bony fish and then we have pictures here that represent each category again that main uh, the three main groups will go into the general example column all right so with respiration the fish is actually breathing in the water it's taking in both carbon dioxide and oxygen and what happens is that as it's taking in that oxygen that oxygen is bathing the cells and providing all the cells with all the oxygen that they, that they need then the, what will happen is that the water then will pass through the gill slits, okay? So again, it goes through the mouth. Uh, it is going through all of the cells, providing all of the fish cells with oxygen and everything that they need, and then it will pass out through the gills slits. Okay, so the, the fish has a fairly simple circulatory system, and it has a two-chamber heart. You're going to learn that as we go up the levels of animal organisms, you're going to learn that it varies from a two-chamber heart all the way up to what we have, which is a four-chamber heart, which is much more efficient than this. So it only has one atrium, one ventricle, and the blood just kind of goes around in a single loop, okay? Now again, it's not as efficient as what happens even in the amphibians, but we're going to learn that in the amphibians, they have a, a three-chambered heart, and then again, we have a four-chamber heart. Makes it more efficient for uh, separation of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Okay, the, the diagram is off a little bit, but um, what's important is to understand that as the fish eats, the, the food's gonna pass through its mouth, then it goes to the esophagus, then to the stomach. The stomach has pouches in it, which are called phyloric cecum. Again, and within these pouches, you're, you're going to have enzymes and other things that are going to help digest the meal. Then it passes through the intestines and then the cloaca. And then you also have the anus there. The anus is going to be pictured here. Okay. Uh, the swim bladder is right here. Uh, swim bladder, we're going to learn later, uh, helps with buoyancy, meaning that it helps them rise and fall in the water. It's what kind of helps them look like they're floating. Okay, the, the fish are able to respond a couple of different ways. Obviously, they have a brain. It's not as uh, cognitively strong as our brain. It's very simple. But they also can communicate in the water. They can detect electricity and even mag 
magnetic movements in the water. And they do that because of that lateral line. Uh, if you look at the, the fish, you'll see those lines, those darkened lines on the side. That actually helps them uh, detect what's going on in the water. Uh, a meal is eating and eaten, depending on the time frame, uh, the organism has to excrete that, that waste product. So ammonia is the, the waste product that fish are going to excrete. Now ammonia is very toxic in its purest form, however, it gets broken down into lower forms of nitrogen in the water. Okay, We see that ammonia and bacteria will break that down to nitrate, and nitrate and bacteria are then are going to break it down into nitrate, which is a lesser form of the nitrogen that is found in ammonia. And so plants and then the changes in the water also help break it down further. If you've ever had a, a pet fish, you know, a goldfish or something like that you had in a fishbowl, you guys have kind of smelt this before when you, you, you smelt the, the waste product, the ammonia and the nitrogen uh, in, in, in the fishbowl. Okay, so again, this substance is created by our kidneys and the kidneys of other organisms like the fish in this example, and then it goes, it's excreted or taken out by both the gills and the bladder as well. All right, so reproduction in the fish occurs in three different ways. If it is an egg lay, and this is a, probably the most prominent way of doing this, oviparous is how that happens. Ovoviviparous is if the eggs are fertilizing but they hatch within the body. And viviparous is if the babies are born alive. Okay, so fed by the mom and born alive. All right, so not only are the fins used for uh, movement and locomotion, dorsal fin, ventral fins, tail fin, but also the swim bladder because the swim bladder helps with buoyancy. So the swim, the swim bladder is going to help with the fish uh, adjusting its height in the water, okay? Uh, so that it can float up, it can float down, okay, it can maintain. The, the swim bladder uh, helps with that. All right, so lung fish are very unique in that they both have gills and they have a lung that helps them uh, come to the surface and gulp air. And it is hypothesized that it was a type of fish similar to this ancestrally that probably was the intermediary between uh, fish and amphibians which fully have lungs and can breathe on the land. Quite often people confuse frogs and toads in particular, uh, but there are some distinguishing characteristics that separate them. Newts and salamanders are very similar as well, but they do as well have defining characteristics. Concerning frogs and toads, if we look at it, a frog uh, structurally is very different. Uh, frog skin are smoother because they are going to a, to uh, breathe through their skin and they also require uh, aquatic environment uh, for their their eggs but their skin is more moist toads as well have a rougher skin is plumpy their body is a little bit more stout large bulging eyes uh, toads tend to have poison glands which are going to be located behind their eyes uh, so the, the eye structure is different frogs would have teeth you know along the perimeter of their mouth and they would have stronger longer legs Frogs can breathe with using two different methods. They can use their skin uh, to breathe through their skin, taking oxygen and expire through their skin. And they can also, obviously, they have lungs, which allow them to transition uh, from tadpole to land-dwelling uh, organism after metamorphosis occur. So the babies, the tadpoles have gills. The adults would breathe through their skin and using their lungs. When we're comparing the heart of fish versus that of a frog or amphibian, frogs and amphibians have three chamber heart. This is an improvement from the fish's heart. It does a better job of separating oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. It is, reduces the amount of time and distance for the blood returning back to the heart because of its double loop, whereby with the fish, you know that it's just that one single loop and takes a little bit longer. So it's a more efficient process of, of separating the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. 
Structurally very similar as far as the digestion goes. Uh, the frog would eat its prey. It would go through the mouth, then the obviously the esophagus, stomach, intestines, and cloaca. The cloaca is interesting because within the cloaca, you would find um, both eggs, sperm would pass through it. Also digestive waste and things like that would pass through the cloaca as well. So all of those items are going to pass through the cloaca. Frogs would use their brain and their brain capacity to respond to, and their nervous system to respond to their environment. Their brains are larger than the fish. They have a couple items that function for their hearing, just like in us, there's a tympanic membrane, which would uh, facilitate the eardrum. They have a nictating membrane, which allows them to obviously survive in the aquatic environment, protects their eyelid, uh, very similar to what we had when we were in our mom's uh, embryo to cover our eyes and protect our eyes so that we could see in our the aquatic environment. And that's what the nictating membrane does for the frog as well, allows it to see underwater. Excretion, uh, similar process. We take, uh, the frog however takes the nitrogenous waste of ammonia and, and converts it to urea, which is different than what happens in the, um, in the fish. Uh, urea it does not have the same toxicity as ammonia and once it's processed the urea is going to get uh, passed through the kidney. This chart goes over the breakdown of proteins and nucleic acids and which kind of waste products are produced. So amino acids and nitrogen base both contain amino groups and in the fish and aquatic uh, fishes and aquatic animals the uh, amino groups are going to be broken down into ammonia. In mammals, amphibians, shark, and bony fishes, urea, and then in birds, insects, reptiles, many reptiles, and land snails, the amino groups will be broken down into uric acid. A vestige of the amphibian, and in particular the frog, uh, being dependent on its aquatic environment is the fact that they need to lay their eggs in the water. So they are tied to the water for that specific reason in that their reproductive, you know, their, their cells, the reproductive cells need the water in order to um, develop. And so there are a couple different ways that it happens. There are special A cases, as you see here on the slide. Uh, A cases can also be uh, laid on the backs of certain frogs as well. So again, frogs are very dependent on the water although they are primarily land-dwelling creatures.